know, it's a great pleasure to introduce somebody as kind of an oft-used word. In fact, I hear it every time somebody gets introduced. However, um, this is a, a guy who those words really cannot be used uh, more expressively for. Uh, we all reap the benefits. When I was at Emory, um, one of the guys who was a guy called Willis Hurst, who wrote the book called The Heart, said, when you drink from the well, honor the people who dug the well. <clears throat> We're all drinking from a well that was dug by our speaker today, and that's Dr. Tom Fogarty. I'm going to say a few words, and then I'm going to get Rod White to make a formal introduction. Because some of the real stories about innovation, and he's going to question what innovation is, really come from things like the Fogarty catheter. We use the Fogarty catheter frequently. And every time I do it, you know, I say to people, you know what this is? It's a Fogarty catheter. Do you know who Fogarty is? And some people do, and some people don't. But almost none of them know the story. Now, you're going to see a guy who's extremely accomplished, basically, in the surgical world and in the innovation world. But you can correct me if I'm wrong, and I know you well. <laughs> is the, to, the story behind the Fogarty catheter was that he developed that not when he was a medical student, not when he was a resident, but when he was a surgical tech. So I called up to the OR and said, make sure all the techs and nurses come down here because innovation does not start and stop with physicians. Everybody can basically do it. And my understanding of the Fogarty catheter was that he was assisting a surgeon. And at that time, to get blood clot out of an artery, you kind of reached up blindly inside the artery with a pair of metal forceps and tried to grab the clot that you thought was up there, but you weren't entirely sure. And Tom thought, there's got to be a better way of doing this. And you were a fisherman and had learned how to tie flies. So he took the tip off a surgical glove, he tied it using fly tying techniques onto the end of a tube, put a syringe on the end of the tube, and basically blew that up. And that surgeon basically used that basically in the next case. That was before grunt second angioplasty, that was before basically endographs were really developed. That, I think, was probably the first endovascular intervention. And to this day, it moves clot unlike anything else. Uh, it moves clot faster and better than anything else, and it stood the test of time. But that was the foundational endovascular uh, development that created angioplasty of this world, stent grafts, stents, and you know they were all developed by other crazy guys. And so one of the other great things is that, is, in the, the, I can't remember who the person was who said this, but they said there's never been a, an advance in medicine that's not been opposed by wise and good men. And so just because you've got a good idea, and just because your mentor said this is the dumbest thing that I've ever heard of, I thought the stents were a terrible idea. I'm sure most things that talk about cornea angioplasty was a dumb idea and couldn't do it. You know, people like Tom really have the fortitude to understand and see the future. And you can be ahead of your time, and you can take a lot of criticism for it, but frequently it's the perseverance of sticking with that idea that really leads to these gigantic breakthroughs. And so that's the man that you're going to hear from today, and you're going to hear about what he thinks about what is innovation. But prior to that, I want to ask one of the past presidents here, uh, Dr. Rod White, to come up here, because uh, he's had a long-term uh, friendship, basically, with Tom. And he's going to say a few words. Some of them would be complimentary. Some of them, you know, you know, as you might expect, a little bit not so complimentary. So, Rod. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks very much. I actually just wanted to come up. Uh, we called Tom, and he, he doesn't like to travel around too much. Uh, you know, he's gotten more awards and hates getting them. And uh, if you look at this whole list of things, you know, he started off as a boxer, I think, you know, that's, so that explains some of the stuff that's going on with Tom. <laughs> uh, and, and then an inventor, and the, the other thing is uh, an entrepreneur, and on the West Coast, startup companies come around, and the first question they ask is Fogarty in, and he drives that entire business, so that, that history goes with him. He's been an awardee, a philanthropist, and his son, where's John at? But uh, there, there he is. Uh, he's the bodyguard for Tom and here getting him in. Um, this is the first Anurex case that we did at Harbor. Um, it really got me going. I was fortunate enough that Tom came to us and George is back there. We did all the animal testing in the lab. And Tom really didn't want anybody to know about it because he figured if it didn't work, you know, you throw it away. And we did a full, almost three years worth of animal testing before anybody knew anything about it, and then it was ready to go. Um, and so really what I learned from that is, and I've seen him do this over time, is reward 
people that you work with, and <clears throat> he, I'm losing my voice with this cold, so. Um, and the other thing is he, he always uh, told me, be the first one to know when a technology is not going to work. And if it's not going to work, get rid of it. Uh, listen more than you learn, and the other one was always salt your bacon and soak your bread in olive oil, and I, I still do that. <laughs> My kids do it, and we blame it on them every time we, you know, dunk it in there. Um, Tom's had all kinds of awards, and again, this is probably one he was very proud of. Here's him with Obama getting the Distinguished Inventor Award. And here's him passing me award, that award on to me. Uh, I know that, uh, Hopefully, Dorothy made it into the URL. That's why I picked this picture, so. Uh, but with that, I want to just, Tom's a great friend, and you're going to appreciate, we're glad to have you here, man, and uh, thanks for coming. Slides. Okay. <laughs> Who's doing that? <laughs> now, the, uh, you know, <clears throat> as I grow older, I still learn. The most recent thing I've learned, probably within the last five years, is uh, my best mentees are now my best mentors. I'm very proud of that. A lot of guys are now teaching me that I was the mentor for. So it's a revelation I never really realized until I had enough mentees that became very, very successful, and I'm very proud of that. So anyway, uh, innovation, uh, it's fun. I'm sure everybody that's been an innovator really has enjoyed what they're doing. Uh, because you, you benefit humankind by innovating. And uh, it's like being a doctor. Uh, we benefit humankind by operating. It's great reward. Innovation is the same thing. If you innovate, that technology can be used by other physicians, and that's rewarding. Because you multiply what a surgeon does. It, it, it's a really interesting cycle that we go through the process of learning. I'm still innovating, and uh, I do so in a private environment, a private hospital. It's called the Institute for Innovation. Our primary purpose is to innovate with a thought and mind that we can, as innovators, reduce health care cost. When we invent something, we have to do it with the idea we used to use the most expensive and best materials that were available, like nitinol. We still use it, but it has some defects. There are other materials that don't have the defects that nitinol have, and it costs less. That's just one example. Uh, there are myriads of other examples uh, why we have to reduce cost. Uh, does everybody know what a wound vac is? Wound vac. Wound vac. Yeah. Wound care. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is a vac. It is. Anyway, the way it works is uh, complex or big ones, and very, very expensive. They're usually in major institutions. It's costly. It's a real inconvenience for a patient because they got to travel to that facility. A lot of people live in the outbacks, and travel is difficult, expensive. But uh, if you had one that was portable, and you could take it, to rural areas, take it to nursing homes where patients have a lot of wounds. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Within the Institute, we have developed a portable wound vac 
costs less, does the same job, very significantly reduce cost, and we, they can afford to buy it in nursing homes. This is something I never thought of, uh, but they came to us at the Institute to help them in the process. Now, the Institute did help them. So what they're doing now, the product's completed. Completed at the Institute. Uh, they've already gotten reimbursement. We have the product, gotten reimbursement. We were able to get them investors who put money into the effort. So they have enough money now, and they're going to be ready to commercialize probably in the next year. That is a fantastic accomplishment. And it's really rewarding to have a group that is able to do that. Another example, uh, everybody knows Chris Aaron. Does anybody know Chris Aarons? <laughs> anyway, he was the first company that we took into the Institute. They were not a company. Uh, but they developed, he and an engineer developed the technology called HeartFlow. Does anybody know what HeartFlow is? There's a lot of stupid shits in this room. <laughs> but anyway, it's a major, major change in the way we're going to treat cardiac disease, primarily coronary disease. It can diagnose coronary disease without an angiogram. Is that what you do, Chris? Well, say yes or no. <laughs> Thank you. But that's amazing. Uh, reduce cost. We don't need angiograms anymore. That is really amazing. I never thought that would happen. Of course, Chris never had anything to do with it. <laughs> no, he was, ran the thing well, along with an engineer. And they started out in the Institute of Innovation at a private hospital, which is a real accomplishment. So uh, it's that kind of award that, that we get by innovating. It's just wonderful. Another example that's come out of the Institute, do you know what the atrial fibrillation is? Ventricular tachycardia? Is there any cardiologist in here? <laughs> but anyway, cardiologists, if during the procedure, they use catheters, which is great. But guess what? It doesn't work as well as it should. It's not durable. Repeated procedures are required. Very costly, very expensive. So the concept of a Stereotactic radio surgery. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah. Well, I didn't until I heard about it. Uh, and I heard about it through another company that I was involved with. And they, I was on the board. And so somebody came to us from offshore and uh, had this idea that uh, we can ablate atrial fibrillation. And the company uh, that I was a board of said no, and it wouldn't do it. So anyway, I found out who the inventors were. I went and talked to them and asked if I could buy their patent. And I did. I bought the patent. Uh, it didn't cost too much, but it cost, and that was fine. So anyway, we went on to develop this concept. Where we did that was mostly 
in my kitchen. <laughs> That's where it started. But it moved from the kitchen to the Institute for Innovation. And so that is now completed. It works. We can ablate ventricular tachycardia. We can ablate atrial fibrillation at reduced cost. <clears throat> Significantly reduced cost. Guess it's a success. It's not only a therapeutic success, it's a financial success. Varian bought that company. Does anybody know who Varian is? Some. Well, anyway, they, they have a technology, linear accelerator, that um, is used to ablate cancer. They're now ablating cardiac arrhythmias. It's very interesting how innovation in many different fields can bring better technology, but at reduced cost. That is something that we have to do. Everybody knows medicine costs too much. Now, we can't get rid of all doctors. They're expensive. But they're, they're kind of heading that direction. Uh, Watch out for socialism. <laughs> but uh, so the implications of what innovation can do for our patients and how we can innovate at the same time provide better care with better technology but at a reduced cost. And that is what we all have to do. No matter it be a service, It just, services cost too much. There are ways to reduce the cost of services. The only service I provide is to my patients. I can't do anything more than that. But there are people that will be able to figure out how to reduce the cost of services. I am not one of them but there are people who do it a lot better. But uh, so we have a challenge ahead of us. And do we have any room for questions? Well, well somebody asked me a question. It has to be one I can answer. Bob, Randy Wolf. Uh, I live about 10 miles from where you grew up, Cincinnati. Oh my God, my condolences. <laughs> What community were you brought up in? I grew up near uh, Harrison, Ohio, across the border in Indiana, not too far from Western Hills. Yeah, I know. Western about 10 Hills, miles away, yeah. off 74. Um, but here's, uh, and, and could you make a point about persistence? And a point, in fact, is, um, as I recall, you started the work on AFib and the intervention with uh, uh, nuclear devices probably 12 years ago. I remember you're working on it in pigs maybe 12 years ago. Could, could you comment on how important persistence is? Because I think initially you didn't get a lot of support for that project. Zero. Uh, so part of the problem, it was the concept was so outlandish. Uh, everybody said it wouldn't work. Well, a lot of innovators have that same problem. This concept is so outlandish, you can't get anybody to invest in it. It's the biggest problem we have in raising money. Far out ideas are the most valuable to humankind, our patients. But they cost a whole lot. Takes a long time. 
takes a lot of personnel. It's very expensive. But if you stick with it and overcome those obstacles, you'll finally get there. Actually, it was, uh, I started that effort 14 years ago. And it was just bought. Now, it's going to move forward because Varian has the hardware and they have the uh, know-how surrounding linear accelerators. Uh, and so they want to increase their business. And they do that by buying a technology that treats something that they've never been involved with before. They've been involved in tumor therapy, not heart therapy. Well, a lot of companies don't like to get out of their lane. And Varian is one of those. There are other companies like that. They just want to do tumor. And uh, it took me about three years of negotiation with Varian to get that technology finally to be acquired. So it's a long road. Tom, could you, in a few basic steps, tell us how you would protect an idea that you have? and then bring it to market? Well, first of all, if you got an idea, you write it down on a piece of paper. Uh, you say, well, what's that mean? Well, it's uh, first discovery. And it counts if you write it down on a piece of paper. The next thing you do, if you can afford it, is get an attorney to help you write up the intellectual property or the patent. and. Uh, don't try to do that yourself, because uh, it's complicated, long, so you got to need an attorney. Um, when I, uh, the first uh, balloon catheter, uh, I, uh, I had no money. My mentor, Jack Cranley, of Cincinnati, Ohio, a vascular surgeon, told me, you got a patent this time. Well, I found an attorney, an attorney, listen, an attorney said, I told him I had no money, he says, that's okay. Pay me when you can. <laughs> An attorney. <laughs> Pay me when you can. I don't think you'll find an attorney in this world. Maybe the world. But uh, they don't do that anymore. So anyway, I, I was fortunate. Uh, but uh, it, it's amazing how lucky one can get to find an attorney to let me pay him off later. And I did. So uh, you just got to keep at it, no matter what the obstacles are. And uh, that's called persistence. And uh, you're going to have to be persistent in the field of innovation. Let me ask you a question, Tom. So you mentioned several times that you work in a small private hospital. Yeah. But we know you used to work at Stanford, and you were on the faculty at Stanford. You clearly made a life decision. What, what factors did you have to consider as a very productive entrepreneur in making that shift? Well, so you I, can tell us about. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm now working in a private hospital. So I've gone full circle. Uh, why? Why? Well, uh, private hospitals want excellence. They understand the importance of technology. The hospital that I work at is called uh, El Camino Hospital, the hospital of Silicon Valley. That's how, so that's where I'm at. So they understand the importance of innovation. They have all the most current things you can buy uh, in the hospital. Uh, they have two different kind of linear accelerators. Uh, very unusual. Uh, they're costly, but they're that much interested in benefiting patients. Uh, so uh, that's what Good Sam was, where I worked with Dr. Cranley. All I'm trying to do is replicate what he did. Any questions? Uh, 
Dr. Escobar from Emory. Thank you very much. So the, the first question I want to know is, was Dr. Lumsden's uh, telling of your story of how you developed your Fogarty catheter accurate? And uh, I'll start with that. Is that. Was that the way it was? You tied a tip of a glove onto a catheter and injected it? Or, or what is the story? Well, you think he'd lie? <laughs> <laughs> You, I, I, are I you new here? I think you could. <laughs> we can all lie. But I don't know. It's accurate. It is. My, my second question is sort of a follow-up to the previous question. I have lots of ideas, and they're all written down. Yeah. But how do you find a patent lawyer? Like, and, and if you do find a patent lawyer, now if I have a patent, my understanding is that there's all sorts of other things, like people can patent around your patent and then sort of like get in your way so that you can do things. How do I have my idea patented? How do I take it to the next level? What Should I send you an email or how do I do that? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> no, at, uh, patenting things is very expensive. And you have to have somebody that's in the field patenting medical devices. So like attorneys, like uh, physicians were highly, highly specialized. And so it's hard to find. They're very expensive. And none of them will do it for nothing. What did they look for? Haven't. <laughs> there ain't around. I, well, there. Uh, that fit the criteria that I was fortunate enough to have, they no longer exist. But uh, uh, I don't know that, I don't, pro bono, some attorneys do pro bono work, but I don't know of any patent attorneys that do pro bono work. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, innovation is good, uh, but the price you pay for innovation is more risk because you know with a new device or idea you don't know the unintended consequences or the different ways it could fail uh, when you first start with the innovation so my my question is how do you manage the risk that comes with innovation well follow the rules that's number one pay attention to the fda uh, if you don't, you'll be in deep shit because they'll get you and catch you. So uh, it, 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 you have to be very, very careful and think of all the entities to get you into trouble and all of the regulations that you have to follow, understand where those regulations come from and what their purpose is. CMS, that's a government. Entity. Their whole purpose is to reduce cost. How do they do it? Well, what is they don't want to pay for anything. So you don't get the technology. So you got to work with CMS. And we at the Institute do that. We work with the FDA. They send people out to our Institute. Uh, Four times a year, and they send usually uh, four of their more senior people from the FDA. We're just starting the relationship with CMS, and we talk to them about sending their people. And CMS is not as quite progressive or aggressive, uh, but we'll get there. And they'll start to send people out so they can see what lack of payment really causes damage to a patient. Because they'll be embedded in the institute. So uh, these problems are sometimes unrecognized. If you recognize them, if you can't fight with them, you want to embrace them, try to make them your friends. Uh, my history with the FDA the, uh, was interesting. Uh, when I was at the NIH, uh, the uh, FDA came to the NIH and asked us 
a group of surgeons to classify devices according to risk, 510Ks. And so I was there two years. We spent two years trying to help them with that uh, effort. And uh, I became good friends with them. And uh, then I became enemies of them. <coughs> Is anybody aware of that? Oh, I did. Uh, Kessler. Do anybody know who Kessler was? Who was Kessler? He was the head of the agency. Was the yeah, yeah. For a long time. Yeah, for, no, three years. That was way too long. But he came to a meeting of cardiac surgeons, and uh, he was a keynote speaker. He proceeded to tell how evil people were, particularly cardiac surgeons. And uh, they were evil because they were doing things they shouldn't do. Uh, well, he's referencing new things. And uh, so they had a round table that I was on. He was going on all of this. And everybody was asking questions. And I said, uh, could I ask a question? said, yes. Oh, it's more of a statement. The statement is, you are full of shit. <laughs> and he was. The whole audience roared. <laughs> he walked out. <laughs> so, but anyway, I was proud of myself. <laughs> Yes. What Mark. What do you see for the future? What? What? What do you see for the future, Tony? Well, what I see, innovation in the field of medicine is, is uh, going to be even more and more critically important because there are many problems in medicine, many different areas. And I think if we handle ourselves, our innovations right, we'll end up reducing costs. That's good for medicine. So uh, that could be, you know, different arenas, and you do it for different reasons, but I think innovation is going to be part of what we have to do better and more often and do it for different things. That's the future. So, Tom, what do you think, there are a bunch of young people who want to invent things and follow in your footsteps. What do you think the three biggest mistakes that somebody with an <coughs> idea makes and never gets to you know, the point where there's clinical trials, for example? Well, a, a, lot, of, a lot of inventors uh, love to invent. There are uh, sometimes people who want to be inventors are people who want to make money. So all they're thinking about is money. I, I was a you know what a venture capitalist is? Well, I was one of those once. The fact that I co-founded it. I think it was 18 months later they kicked me out. Why? Venture capitalists are nothing but vultures. I call them vulture capitalists. <laughs> It's a very appropriate name. I don't associate with those assholes anymore. <laughs> there are a few non-assholes, but not many, that are out there now. But uh, I, I, you can't work with people who have the wrong motives. And uh, sometimes people want to make so much money they lose sight of what they're here for. Uh, you know, we all like to make money, but if that's all you're focused on, uh, I don't want to be around them. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Are there any other mistakes that a young innovator makes? Stay away from venture capitalists. We got, we got that part. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
What the state? What what what? Uh, yeah. What are the common mistakes you see and oh, someone okay. who comes along with an idea? Uh, they think they if they're very young, they a lot of young and whatever. They think they know so much, and they're so focused on. Uh, being important by knowing so much. Another example of uh, what came into the Institute, a very attractive young lady that um, her effort was primarily to postpartum hemorrhage. Does everybody know what that is? Well, it's bad. It's where the baby often dies, sometimes the mother dies, a big problem. And so we were very anxious to try to help them. They came to the Institute, and guess what? The lady who started that would not listen. She went to a very prestigious engineering school. She was attractive. She wasn't very eloquent. Uh, so uh, I put a lot of money into it, and they asked for more money, and I said, no way. Uh, I'm not going to do that. And I hated to do that, because you, you know, mothers who die, everybody wants to make that go away. So we were all enthusiastic about it, but she hurt his head. There's no way. And when they asked me to... Uh, put more money in, I said, yeah, if you fire this young, attractive lady. And they said they would. So I was going to give them the money. But then I found out they really did fire her. What do you think I did? What? No, I kicked them out. So uh, there are all kind of situations. One is, if anybody thinks they know a whole lot and they're very, very young, watch out. This lady uh, was from Caltech, very prestigious university in California. She got great grades. She was one of these 20 under 20. That it's, uh, they predict who's going to be most successful. She was one of them. So, uh, you know, we were hopeful that we we're going to make it. We didn't. So uh, some of the biggest deterrents you don't recognize uh, until you've experienced one of those deterrents. And, uh, thing I learned is that very brilliant people from very prestigious institutions with all kind of awards are easy to like, but many of them are full of shit. <laughs> and that can cost you. What's your name, sir? <laughs> I'm just a simple practicing uh, vascular surgeon and so my question is uh, most of the great thoughts and innovation and ideas come from real world situations taking care of patients Yeah. and practitioners who take good care of the patients have a lot of great ideas so let's say somebody comes up with an idea, and it's a great, really promising idea. And now how do you handle the problem of translating that? Because if you now start spending time on that innovation, you can't take care of your patients. You give that idea to someone else. Um, it's, it's a dilemma to balance spending the time on working on your innovation against your day job of taking care of patients? Well, you can innovate in some 
uh, communities, environments than others. Uh, at Stanford, uh, I was hired and refired two different times because I was interested in commercialization. Academia feels very often that those who relate to commercial entities are evil. Industry and the representatives of industries are often there only to contaminate the academic mission. That's why they don't like salespeople getting into hospitals. At Stanford, they were so adamant about the salespeople, they used to give you pencils or pens, that the dean required them to put him in a large basket outside of his office because they were contaminating by bribery with a pencil. That was one reason I left Stanford the first time. Uh, the second time, uh, Chris knows something about that. Because <laughs> he was there when I left the second time. <laughs> he said, I liked the dean. I hated the dean. I hated that son of a bitch. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I know he wasn't going to go, so I went. But anyway, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Hatred sometimes can be a good thing. <laughs> Get out of the environment of which you hate. I love Stanford. So, so Tom, with, with your permission, the only problem with you is you're from California. We prefer the Texas-based innovators, and you know <laughs> we, managed, we managed to persuade. We have one Tom Fogarty wannabe sitting back here. We'll get him in a minute. But Chris, I did not know that HeartFlow went through the institute. And can you just tell us a little bit about the development of HeartFlow? Yeah. Well, so we were doing a lot of research in the labs uh, and uh, computational fluid dynamics initially related to aortic stent grafts in the aorta and then uh, coronary CTs came along uh, and then uh, we started applying the fluid dynamics to solving problems when the coronary arteries because the human data was available from coronary CT scans. So to start developing this idea, and we thought that maybe this was value to patient care, we actually had to um, get out of Stanford because you couldn't do this kind of thing at Stanford. So we formed a company uh, for purposes of applying for SBIR grants. These are research grants th available through the NIH to commercialize and develop clinically relevant ideas. And so in order to do that, we needed to be outside of Stanford, and there had to be a company. So we established a company, and the Fogarty Institute was just developing, and I mean just developing. There was zero in there, except Tom. Uh, yeah, that's And Tom right. was kind enough Talking about to my money. <laughs> <laughs> And, and uh, Tom was kind enough to uh, give us space so that we had a physical place to be uh, for, because we had to be out of uh, Stanford. And so that was really the, the core. Um, and uh, out of that um, uh, ability to be there, we then could further develop the concept and the idea, which then became clinically relevant with the, with the uh, basically the clinical evidence from the FAME studies, which were published in 2009, to show that there's clinical benefit to patients to use FFR for treatment guidance for coronary disease. So I first met uh, Chris really through a guy called David Koo. David was um, 
an engineer who worked with the group at Emory, actually still does, I believe, Guillermo worked with the, the group at Emory, and he was interested in hemodynamics and flow. And so one of the things I'd always say is, if you want to be an innovator, look to the people who have done it before. You see the same people who innovate again and again and again and successfully do it, and those are the people that you need to emulate. Billy, never a man short of a few words. <laughs> so let me introduce Dr. Billy Cohn. Billy uh, heads up the Center for Device Innovation with Jane and j over here in uh, Texas Medical Center and been known to innovate a couple of times himself. My main secret hey, to wait, success. Wait a minute. Do you let Billy Cohn in his audience? <laughs> Ow! What's going on? So the secret to my success is watch Tom do what he does, say what he says. Uh, he's one of my main mentors and has taught me a great deal. Hey. And that's all I've got to say on the subject. You're a wise man. <clears throat> Any final questions for Dr. Fogarty? If not, let me just, on behalf of everybody at the ISCVS, say thank you. Thank you. Thank you.